thanks for coming out, everybody. Hope you've been enjoying the uh, drinks and food and everything. Uh, tonight we've got some great speakers out from uh, the Linux world and the Microsoft world. Uh, so uh, it's a great mix. Uh, we've got the uh, the lab server up here that's got running Red Hat and Windows 10 uh, and Server 2016. So if you didn't get to it tonight, the next pug group will still have it again. Uh, it'll be at every pug group and we'll be evolving that. The touch screen wasn't working tonight, but we'll get the touch screen working as well. Uh, the idea there is that everybody can uh, have a bit of a play with the uh, hybrid technology and uh, see see what that's like between uh, the on-premise and that cloud world up there as well. So tonight's uh, topic is on cloud OS, hence why we're talking about Linux and uh, Windows. Um, so we'll go through, or we'll just thank our sponsors quickly. I'll do a quick cloud recap on what's happened in the last month. Uh, we'll uh, invite up our first guest speaker about Red Hat Linux, and then uh, we'll have our second speaker about uh, the Windows world, and then if anybody has any lightning talks about what they've been doing in the cloud recently, or have an app or anything like that you'd like to share with the rest of us, uh, feel free to jump up and uh, get your five minutes worth of fame. Uh, so, just quickly about Pug, uh, we've got over 200 members now. Uh, we are looking for speakers on big data and analytics. If you're not aware, we put out a vote online uh, the other month to with a list of topics there on what people might be interested in. Uh, big data and analytics is leading the charge at the moment, so I'm planning on uh, doing something around that. So if you know anybody who's an expert in that area, maybe there's a startup or somebody who's uh, technical or sales driven or anything uh, on that topic, uh, be really interesting to get them in to talk to us about that. Uh, volunteers, always looking for volunteers to help out, uh, make this happen. Um, and yeah, just the uh, focus for this is really around education. Uh, no agenda, but just cloud, so we want to keep it related to what's happening in this cloud world. Whether it be private cloud, public cloud, uh, hybrid, uh, it's all connected. Um, and then all these videos that we're taking of these events are all up online. So the past ones are up on coffeecloud.net. Um, and also up there are uh, the slide decks and uh, the uh, the past next slide that I'm going to do, the highlights of the cloud. Uh, if you miss what I'm going through quickly, it is quite a big slide. Uh, it's all up there online. It'll probably be up there by the end of the week, this month's and previous months if you want to see a recap of how the cloud's been progressing and what's been changing there. Um, and if you're part of any other user groups, we're happy to uh, donate our time and services of the uh, recording and editing of these events uh, to put them up as well to help the community. Uh, and just, um, yeah, there's a bit of a pun on the name for the uh, the lab server, uh, Labrador, keeping with the theme of uh, dogs. Uh. So just a quick thank to our sponsors, Nutanix and Trend Micro, Soft Choice, Veeam, uh, all help make this happen, pay for the food tonight. Also Robson's tonight uh, with the venue and also helping out with the food and drinks as well. Uh, so if we didn't have these sponsors, um, it would be pretty hard to, I mean we could still make this happen, but we wouldn't be having as much fun. Uh, so getting into it, the recap, what happened in August? So OpenStack, Red Hat, I thought this was relevant to tonight's speech. And also, you'll notice a bit of a theme. Uh, I did seem to notice in August there was a lot of movement on the container space. And you'll also notice uh, speakers on Red Hat and Windows tonight will actually talk about containerization, Docker, and their own containerization versions tonight. Um, so Red Hat uh, went general availability with their Satellite 6.1, which actually one of the features, there's a few extra features there around security and other things, but one of them was around uh, being able to uh, manage your containers. Uh, and then uh, RHEL went uh, general available with their OpenStack Platform 7. 
uh, Azure. Now, I have taken up a big section for this Azure bit, but I think this is interesting. This is something that uh, Jeff and I are going to try to put something together in the next week around, is at the end of this month, uh, Microsoft are doing a uh, purely online conference for Azure. So it's all going to be online. And our thinking is that, yes, we could all sit at home and uh, drink beers on our own watching the conference, but it would be more fun if we all got together in a community and watched this online uh, and drank beers and had somebody else pay for them. <laughs> so <laughs> so we're, we're trying to get that together. Uh, probably an announcement on the pub group uh, probably in the next week uh, around making something downtown happen around that. Obviously, the logistics of having beer quietness and bandwidth all happen within the same area. Um, might be a bit challenging, but I'm sure we can make something happen. Uh, but the idea of this is it's not just like jumping onto YouTube and watching it later. There will be live keynotes by uh, high-level people within Microsoft. There will be announcements around Azure happening. Uh, there will be an interactive question and answer, so we might actually have somebody up the front taking the questions down from everybody and writing them and all having a laugh at the response, oh, I don't know. Um, and then maybe we'll all go away and do the technical labs on our own. So that's the idea at the moment. Uh, we'll all let you know how that uh, dishes out. Uh, and then just, uh, I'll be putting this up online uh, so you don't have to worry about these URL addresses, but just some articles around Azure that I found uh, interesting this month. Um, just around containerization. Um, it was really talking about the trends and how Microsoft is evolving towards that uh, and bringing that into, which uh, Terence will be talking about later on tonight. Uh, but I thought that article was pretty interesting. It was nicely broken down. Um, and then there was also an article on Windows 10 about backing up uh, straight to Azure's backup. Uh, I haven't actually read this one yet, but it's on my uh, bookmarks to read, so I thought I'd share that as well. Um, and then Amazon down here, AWS, uh, they've always got a massive amount of announcements. It was hard to narrow it down to just two because I was running out of space here. Um, but uh, again, containers, containerization came up. Uh, CloudWatch, which is their monitoring service that gives you uh, uh, sort of like a health check that you can do, uh, set thresholds to get alerts on and things like that. Uh, that's now supported in their containerization service. And then also spot instances, which are kind of like bidding on people who are reselling uh, server time on Amazon that they've now realized that they're not going to use. Uh, you can do a lot of automation around this now. Uh, they did have this previously, but it was very, very limited. You could only set one bid price and you could only set one type of server. Now you can actually set uh, a range, so and then it'll automatically spin these servers up. Uh, so great for research or uh, universities and uh, those sort of areas of uh, where computer is important, but the server is disposable, so you could spin it up and then delete it without worrying. It just adds to the compute power uh, to that process to get things done quicker. Um, so those are the those are the announcements there. Again, if anybody ever has any cloud areas that they feel that I'm missing out when I do this, uh, let me know. It is hard trolling around the internet, so if anybody has any announcements that they hear about the cloud. Uh, obviously, to be honest, Amazon gets mentioned here all the time because they have a great web page that talks about all their news. Uh, Google rarely gets mentioned because they have an awful page. Uh, but if you know, if you've got a pulse on what's happening, feel free to send me an email before each event, and I'll happily add in those sort of announcements. Yes. That's it. Amazon's coming to Vancouver. Amazon might be coming to Canada? Well, I know Microsoft Azure is. No, we got a little insight today. Amazon never these types of things, but they bought a bunch of land in Toronto. 
<laughs> and Ooh. supposedly they're building a Canadian data center. They never announce. It's just Amazon has the reputation of just, hey, we have this now. Okay. <laughs> it's probably semi top secret. So it's it's rumor and speculation, but it looks like it's going to be a It doesn't surprise me. I think if we play back the videos from previous pug groups when I was talking about Azure coming out to Canada, I think I could probably be quoted as saying AWS will be putting up their hand saying me too, me too. Uh, just like in Australia, Amazon came to Australia and Microsoft was telling us they'll never come to Australia before that and then as soon as Amazon was there, uh, Microsoft was there as well. So it's all about the first person to step, to make the move, uh, Microsoft and Azure uh, Microsoft and Amazon are the two biggest cloud players, so it doesn't surprise me. Um, but it'd be nice to know this sort of stuff. Maybe next month at reInvent, Amazon's big, big event, we'll find out more. Uh, yeah. I'm surprised salespeople know something about the technical side of things. Sorry? I'm pretty sure it was your boss that told us that, because it was a very busy day. That surprised me even more, for him to know more than me. He's keeping things from yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, keeping it from the world. I should get him to write a blog, and we can all learn. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, we've got Paul here. Um, Where did you get that? <laughs> hey, it's publicly available information. It's open source. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I forgot. So I need to mention, uh, Paul comes from a technical aspect. And he's also a long distance runner. So if you've got anything to throw, I think you'll miss. <laughs> thanks, Matt. Okay. Um, I wanted to say thanks for Matt just uh, for inviting Red Hat over. Um, a little bit about my history before we jump into the slide here. So I've been with Red Hat <coughs> just over four months now. So I came from Semantic Software, and prior to that, I was with Veritas. So uh, predominantly in the infrastructure build side, so I've done a lot of work with uh, with telcos across Canada, primarily uh, Bell, Rogers, uh, Telus, uh, and Shaw Communications. So, your commentary around uh, Amazon and Azure coming to Canada, I'm sure uh, Telus and Bell will be very interested in understanding a little bit more about that. So, um, I normally speak for at least two hours. So I'll try and keep this to an hour and a half, if that's okay. Um, so apparently I've got 10 or 15 minutes, so I'm either going to go through slides really quick, or I'm going to talk really quickly. So um, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about um, a little bit about Red Hat. Um, obviously, being fairly new to the company, I, this is fresh in my mind. So a little bit about what Red Hat does in your organization, and really focusing on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux platform. Um, the, the discussion around containers is, is germane. I was at the OpenStack uh, Summit back in May in Vancouver, and every other sentence was, was, uh, was injected with the word container. So we'll talk a little bit about containers. Um, some of the observations that Red Hat is seeing in the marketplace in terms of how organizations are, are developing clouds, whether those are private, public, or hybrid, and if they are looking to go to public cloud infrastructures, how are they envisaging getting there? I mean, it's, it's very easy to you know, talk about uh, public clouds, but in reality, a lot of these infrastructures, uh, legacy infrastructures especially that are built out, are extremely complicated for the most part. And getting those applications and platforms into a public cloud can be very problematic. So we'll talk a little bit about what Red Hat is doing to try and influence um, some of the upstream projects in the open source community to try and make that transition as smooth as possible. So um, just a little bit about Red Hat as an organization. Um, they are um, about 9,000 people strong globally. Uh, we have two distinct, uh, dis distinct streams. Uh, my role is as a, a cloud infrastructure SA, so I deal predominantly with the operating systems, open stack, uh, and management platforms. And then on the other side of the house, we have our JBoss acquisition, which is middleware. So this is all to do with DevOps, which is a very germane conversation when it comes to cloud, but how do you leverage clouds for rapid development and prototyping? So we'll be talking today around, uh, around operating systems predominantly, but just to give you a, a sort of a, a picture paints a, a thousand words, we do a lot more than just the operating system. One thing that um, is very germane when you start talking about um, the Red Hat operating system 
is, is how that technology is licensed. And, and, and Red Hat is, very, uh, is a very different model. Um, we, have, we don't have the notion of a license and then a perpetual maintenance. We, we base our technologies on a subscription basis. Which when you start talking about clouds, and leveraging clouds, and, and the movement of those subscriptions between on-prem and off-prem infrastructure, it becomes very, very easy to do that with a subscription. We'll talk a little bit about our cloud subscription model in a few slides here. But transitioning those subscriptions from internal clouds to external clouds is extremely easy. And um, it really puts a focus back, back onto Red Hat to ensure that customers that are building clouds of our technology have a good experience year in, year out uh, with those technologies. Otherwise, they will, just, uh, they will just return their subscriptions and go back to the open source community. Application is king. And I was chatting with, um, with a couple of people here uh, just before we started. And it really is the application is king. It's no longer, if a customer wants to run an application, they're no longer necessarily even concerned with what operating system it's running on. Yes, they like the idea of containers. Yes, they like the idea of virtualization. But at the end of the day, it's all about the application. Whether that's running on a Linux platform, whether it's running on Windows, whether it's running on a combination of the two is really mute to the conversation. It's about the application and where the application resides and how it functions within that infrastructure. This is an interesting slide, and I'm sure um, you know the Microsoft guys will probably agree with this. There are two domain operating systems in the data center today, and this, this yellow band in the middle here is traditional Unix. So this is your Solaris and your HPUX and your IBMs, etc. Um, in you know certainly today and, and going forward, there would predominantly be two operating systems in the data center: it would be Windows and some flavor of Linux. Um, so this is an interesting sort of an analogy in terms of when you're looking at private and public clouds, is just, just recognizing that those are the two predominant uh, platforms within the uh, cloud infrastructure. A little bit about Red Hat um, in terms of the Linux distribution. So one thing that's very popular with Red Hat as, a, as an enterprise platform is we have a very, very strong ISV and H, uh, IHV infrastructure. So. We don't just take the upsource community uh, projects and, and build them into a Linux platform. We make sure that they're certified with different cloud providers. So we've heard AWS and Google and Azure. Um, just making sure that we have a very, very rich ISV and application uh, catalog, if you will, is key to the success of these platforms. I'll talk a little bit later in a few minutes about containerization. It's also key for containerization as well. So containers are really, really cool technologies, but if you don't have any certified applications built around that concept of Docker, for example, then it becomes problematic. It becomes fragmented in the industry. In terms of uh, workloads that uh, are run with Red Hat, I shan't go through this slide. It's just slideware. Um, I came from Semantic Software. Just as a, a, a footnote, they had about uh, 17,000 uh, RHEL virtual machines uh, based on VMware, coincidentally, uh, running RHEL in, in very mission critical uh, applications. So this is really sort of Red Hat's vision for, for cloud. Um, at the end of the day, we're not concerned whether you're developing cloud on physical assets, uh, virtual assets. We don't really care what the hypervisor is. Could be KVM, could be Hyper-V or VMware. Um, we don't care whether it's a public or private cloud. We want to ensure that the experience of the end customer is consistent across those environments. So you may build uh, a VMware uh, farm here with RHEL running on it. How do I take that those RHEL instances and migrate them to a OpenStack cloud or a public AWS cloud and do that in a seamless fashion? So we're focused really on the on the overarching engineering effort to achieve that as smoothly and as simply as possible. So really the vision is around um, trying to create this uh, open hybrid cloud. Shan't go into particular uh, product uh, uh, names or name, name cultures, but really it's about creating a consistent look and feel across those different components. A little bit about uh, Enterprise, uh, REL Enterprise 7, that actually went GA in August of last year, and we're about to release 7.1 7 in a few months here. But in terms of uh, the relevance to, to cloud infrastructure, we've just recently released a um, lightweight version of RHEL called RHEL Atomic. So this is specifically designed for hosting of containers. 
So for those of you who are familiar with containers, um, anybody working with Docker in the room here? Familiar with Docker? Um, the density of, uh, of Docker containers compared to traditional VMs is about a 10 or a 12 to 1. So if you're running a 10 to 1 density for VMs, on the same hardware, you're looking at about anywhere from an 80 to 100 to 1 density with containers uh, running on a common OS platform. So from an ROI perspective, it's huge. So what we've done here is, yes, you can run containers on a full version of RHEL, but we've also released a lightweight version of RHEL called RHEL Atomic, which is specifically designed just to run containers. Okay? Um, if you're familiar with OpenStack and, and what uh, Red Hat's doing in the OpenStack arena, we make RHEL Atomic available as part of a, a standard OpenStack distribution so you can run containers in a secure, lightweight format. A couple of other areas that are, are, are germane to just cloud in general, Windows operability or interoperability. So with RHEL 7, we can now um, authenticate to, uh, to, to Windows domains, for example, which wasn't available under RHEL 6. So we're starting to tighten that relationship between authentication models within Windows and Linux environments, because often we're encountering both. It's very rare that we'll encounter one or the other. You typically come across both. Um, in terms of containers, um, and you know, being with Red Hat just uh, just over four months now, this this was a, an observation I made at OpenStack. Is there are a lot of different open source projects uh, that are on the go around containers. I mean, obviously, Docker is one of the main container formats, but there's many many different container formats out there. It's a double-edged sword, right? Um, the risk is that container formats become fragmented. So, in other words, there are no standards and everybody's off doing different things, which kind of defeats the purpose of containers in general. So what Red Hat's committed to doing, and we've committed along with, uh, with VMware, with Microsoft, with HP, there are a number of large organizations that have, have gone on board with this, is trying to drive some standards around not just container formats, but how do we maintain security within those container formats? Um, how do we build um, you know, an ecosystem? So in other words, um, Think of it as a library of applications that you can pull from. So think of this as like your Apple um, uh, Marketplace or your Google Marketplace. You will download applications in a very similar format, but as a container. Okay. Um, so Oracle, for example, is already doing this with the containers today. So we're trying to drive these standards, um, build out a, a, a standard format for the applications, the ecosystems, the management, so that irrespective of who's using containers, they are portable between these infrastructure builds. That makes sense. So, a container is just a packaged application. Or? Yeah. So, um, in a nutshell, what, what a container is is it's um, think of a virtual machine. So, yeah. a virtual machine is carrying around the operating system with it, or a yeah. copy of the operating system. You strip out all the common operating system components, and you only carry around the application, yeah. its data potentially, and any shared libraries that 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 specific application requires. So a footprint that may have been 10 gigs in size suddenly becomes less than a gig in size because you're not carrying around multiple copies of that OS, whether it's Windows or, or Linux is really moot. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's, uh, and you can see if you look at, you know, what Microsoft's doing, what VMware's doing, and what Red Hat's doing is, it is the next wave of application level virtualization versus OS level. The application doesn't depend on the OS? Uh, it, it depends upon common libraries within the OS. So if I've got 10 applications and they're all, they all all use system.dll on, yeah. on a Windows 2012 distribution, yeah. I'm not carrying 10 copies. 10 copies of that around, I'm only carrying one. And in a lot of cases, that one copy will probably be in memory or it'll be on solid state drive for quick access. Um, but I'm only carrying one copy of it. Some networking wrapper, and yes, yeah, and networking and security and a, bu a bunch of other considerations. Absolutely. Kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, a little bit about uh, just what Red Hat's doing in terms of, uh, of product suites. Not going to spend too much time on this, but um, Atomic Enterprise Platform um, are for customers who want to develop container-based applications right out of the gate. They're doing it in their own house. They may be using OpenStack to do it, but they want to use the Atomic platform to do it. Um, they may be doing some application development, and we really don't have time to talk about DevOps here, but a rapid prototype of applications where they're using container concepts 
to quickly develop applications. And the best analogy I can take is OpenStack Summit in May came out of the Jet Proposal Labs presentation. There's a guy next to me coding changes to Overt, which is the management framework for KVM. And within four hours, he made the changes, submitted them for peer review, and they have been committed. And they were using a container platform to do this. Okay? So what would traditionally, in a traditional software engineering environment, take weeks, if not months, is now being cut down to hours. And they were using containers to, to prototype that. And last but not least is the cloud suite, and this is where customers who are looking at developing their own internal clouds, and they may be considering hybrid clouds, um, the notion of cloud bursting, okay? I mean, everybody is from, pretty much from Vancouver here, right? We had a storm last week, I think it was. Okay. And I don't know if anybody went to BC Hydro's website. Matt, you made a comment on this. It was down, right? Matt? It was down. Okay. And it was down because it just was never designed for that amount of people hitting that infrastructure, right? So the concept of being able to burst to the cloud, BC Hydro likely knew the storm was coming. Um, had they been able to burst to the cloud, they would have been able to rapidly provision new infrastructure in a cloud to, to account for that type of load, people hitting that website trying to figure out where's my outage, when, my, when is my power coming back? So that's a great, you know, example close to the heart of where oh, containers were. Why were people without electricity <laughs> able to get on the internet to find out when their mm -hmm. the electricity would be back on? How did they travel? <laughs> the car. <laughs> <laughs> and, and BC Hydro is one of my accounts, so. <laughs> I think that conversation's already happened. It was the hits to the website. It was the load on the website. Yeah. Was it the bandwidth or the amount of servers yeah. sitting there? It was the actual. It was the, actually the load on the front end web servers. Okay. Yeah, they just couldn't keep up. Um, so you know, you, it begs so the question. Sort of yeah, it begs the question. Do you know? Had it, had I known this this storm was coming, which in this case we did, we you know they could have provisioned some additional yeah, infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, this is where the technology is going, right? So I mean, we, nobody can predict disasters, right? So you know, think of a world where systems will automatically burst out when those situations are encountered. So if 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 the web presence is being uh, stressed for whatever reason, the system's smart enough to recognize that and actually do its own cloud bursting automatically. Um, in the case of the storm last week, we had some warning, so I'm surprised uh, BC Hydro wasn't able to accommodate that. Okay, my clicker's not. Okay, no, just in the auspice of time. Um, not going to talk too much to this slide other than it shows private. Um, OpenStack, and on the far right is, is public cloud. Um, so going back to my earlier comment, irrespective of how you're building clouds, whether it's internal, external, or some combination, the management experience and the capabilities should be consistent across those different cloud builds. Okay, um, and we could have a long conversation about about cloud migrations and how to migrate VMs into containers and and, and, and the whole OpenStack experience. We'll, we'll save that for another part presentation. A little bit about our uh, Certified Cloud Providers Program. Um, so this is uh, for organizations. So TELUS obviously is, um, this is public knowledge. I mean, they presented at OpenStack. They're, they're deploying OpenStack as, as part of their uh, cloud initiative. Um, and they're using uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux as part of their OpenStack distribution. Um, but the, the, the Red Hat Certified Cloud Providers is really around, irrespective of where these XSPs are deploying Red Hat technology, uh, they can transfer those, those subscriptions between you know, their traditional infrastructure build and their new cloud builds. So it allows them to easily migrate. I think, Sorry, Paul, I think my QA quality assurance on the last few slides might have been 
you mean I can only see half the slide? <laughs> well, when you get the slides in PDF, it's... let's not blame you. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, just a little comment on last but not least is, is trying to pull all this together and you know we've talked about a bunch of different things, but really it comes down to your cloud is your is your underlying infrastructures, um, variety of different different cloud initiatives. Containers is a very, very hot topic. So if anybody's in the room looking at a at uh, the next sort of wave of um, of application level virtualization is definitely in the in the area of containers. Uh, microservices I really didn't talk about, but this is where you would um, take the concept of containers and break down services into what we call microservices. So my son loves playing with Lego, right? So imagine a world where you can get lots of different Lego blocks and bolt them together to create different services. That in essence is what a microservice is, and then you sit it inside a container. And then last but not least is, is DevOps. Um, and the rapid the ability to rapidly prototype applications without having to reinvent the wheel each time. So, you know, for the likes of the previous slide that tell us is the Bells of Rogers, or anybody for that matter that's developing a cloud-based presence, getting to market as quickly as possible is huge. It's a huge competitive advantage. So being able to do that in days or weeks versus months and years in some cases is huge. So just in the absence of time, I'll stop there. Um, that was 16 minutes. Is there any questions? And remember, I've been with Red Hat for just over four months. And I heard a bunch of people chatting about disaster recovery. So if anybody wants to talk about that, I spent 15 years doing that. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. See, this, this was saying full at the start of the night. So. <laughs> I've been wondering how long we could go. It's been a good 12 months, so those batteries served as well. But <laughs> okay, so for the rest of the night, we're going to, Terence, you're going to have to do a little <laughs> finger play. That's all right. We, we like seeing people's side on views. By the way, um, has everybody tonight? I meant to grab it, but um, uh, oh, let me let me go grab it. Absent minded. Did everybody tonight get one of these? One of the red hat glasses? Yeah, exactly. We want to uh, burn your brains every day with the red hat logo when you're at work having a beer, obviously. <laughs> so uh, let me know afterwards if you missed out. Got a heap, heap at the back there still, um, and I, I, I can only have so many Red Hat glasses in my shelf at home before my Microsoft glasses get jealous. So, <laughs> where are the Microsoft glasses? <laughs> so, on that note about Microsoft, uh, tonight we've got uh, Terence here from Soft Choice, uh, which is also where I work. Um, and Terence is a Microsoft Solutions Architect, so again, technical aspect, so you're not getting a sales pitch. Uh, he has an MCSE, and MCITP, hadn't heard of that one before, but so many acronyms with the education system. And also on uh, Trend Micro with the uh, TCSE, with the security expert. So, lot, lot of... Love to see your business card. It'd be like a doctor where you get like <laughs> all these acronyms at the end. Um, and hopefully he's chosen English to speak to us in, tonight because I don't know Dutch or German. So, <laughs> so I hand it over to you, Terence. Thanks. Thanks, man. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's really wonderful you take out time out of your busy schedules. Uh, second of all, thank you to all our sponsored and. Uh, Last but not least, I want to have a round of, round of applause from Matt for organizing this every every month. Thanks, Matt. Cheers, mate. So I'm a Microsoft Solutions Architect. So I um, uh, technical pre-sales. I help with uh, discussions about Microsoft technologies. Um, focused a lot on uh, Office 365 and Azure. Um, I joined SoftChoice two months ago. Uh, so pretty new in this role. Uh, before that, I was uh, six years with Compigen, 
which is now, uh, because of their merger, the biggest uh, national service provider here in Canada. So I missed that, but that's, that's fine. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I started my, my career installing Windows 95 on PCs and uh, uh, made a lot of money out of that because it wasn't free back then, right? So uh, what is awesome about Windows 10? It's free. Don't you agree? No? <laughs> so probably next year Microsoft will get us back with some kind of subscription model, but we'll we'll find it out. So what what's uh, what's amazing in Windows 10? Why is it a cloud OS? I think is um, there are 75 million or over 75 million installations to date. Uh, it can only happen because uh, the backend is cloud. So you download it from cloud and installs from the cloud. It's, um, the in-place installation is, is really straightforward. Um, now it's fully integrated with OneDrive, like Windows 8.1 8 was kind of, but now it's fully integrated. Uh, same for your office, so if you save office files, you can select OneDrive. Um, and the other one is Internet of Things. Windows 10 comes to, will come to uh, a lot of um, how do you call it? Uh, a lot of lot of other devices and data will be collected in Azure, and you can fire off uh, intelligence on it, BI, Power BI, etc. Um, one cool thing I like is Xbox streaming. So I actually tried it; and it's pretty cool. My Xbox is in my living room, and if my family is watching TV, I can go into my office and play Xbox games on my laptop. So that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, so I locked the door, right, so my kids don't come in. Uh, Cortana is one of the favorite uh, features of my son. He's two years old. So he comes in and he says, hey, Cortana, and he says, sing me a lull lullaby. And um, I guess he started to, to learn French because he, he can actually sing Frere Jacques now because Cortana sings Frere Jacques. Um, I don't know who, who used Cortana. Who's nobody yet? Why not? Is that, is that with Windows? Or? Yeah, Windows 10 is Cortana. <laughs> so it's it's like it's it's Siri, but then better. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, because if I ask Siri, like I have an iPad and my son uses the iPad and he says, "Sing me a song," and Siri, I I didn't get that. And I'm like, oh, okay. So Cortana is your personal digital assistant. You can uh, schedule meetings. Uh, you can send email, etc. Right. So it's speech speech enabled uh, Windows 10, and of course the start menu is back. Awesome. Is there a Pro version or is this Windows 10? Uh, yeah, Windows 10 is um, like, I don't know what the basic version is, but there is a Pro version and an Enterprise version. So there's like three versions. Um, then how to deploy Windows 10 in place, only do in place. For your activated Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, do an in place installation because it will migrate seamlessly all your information. Some apps will stop working, but uh, most of the stuff will, will work fine. So the other options for enterprises are wipe and load or provisioning. Um, so provisioning is, is normally in enterprises where you have like an SCCM environment, uh, etc. So the in-place upgrade, is it, does it try and advise you what apps you need? Yeah, so it will give you a compat compatibility report before uh, you go ahead and it will, will show you what will work and what won't work. So um, the ones I did, most of them said, yeah, go ahead. So there were, were no issues. It's also good to do a disk cleanup afterwards. After you're like right. comfortable, right? Because it has restore points, but after you're like on there for a month, you just want to disk clean up. And yeah, that, that saves you another 10 to 20 gigs because yeah. of the Windows.alt folder. Okay, then we're moving on to Windows Server 2016. This is the exciting stuff. Um, and the next slide. So um, virtualization, like in Windows Server, uh, introduced in 2008. Um, yeah, version one, we all know version one Microsoft, is, it works, <laughs> so to speak, right? <laughs> More or less. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in 2012, 2012 R2, it, it became, <laughs> Right, you get scaling, performance, um, improvements. Uh, 2012 R2 Azure as the design point, so all the learnings from, from Microsoft Azure, uh, they brought that back in the on-prem. 
uh, Windows Server. And then now with Windows Server 2016, because of the cloud first innovation, a lot of the innovations in, in the cloud like containers, server, uh, non, Windows Nano Server, uh, etc. cetera, um, they are being brought to, for your on-premises. So these are uh, some of the innovations. So we got shielded VMs, um, basically ad added security for your VM so you can uh, specify which fabric the VM runs on. Uh, you can really lock it down, so only um, this, this specific fabric with this namespace, your VM can run on that. So if you port that VM to a different fabric or a different environment, it will not start up. Uh, I'll also add that I, I like this because it'll keep the host providers honest, I feel. Right. Like when a host says that you're going to get something, but it's a multi tenanted environment, you're going to be able to use shielded VM to say, okay, I want shielded VM and I want my VM to be this. And they're not going to be able to change that. Right. Yeah, I, I got a slide next about this as well. and. Um, it will it will show some more information on it. Uh, Linux Secure Boot, uh, so you can protect your Linux uh, VMs from booting on, kind of like shielded VM, but uh, it's a secure boot. Um, Software Define have in here because that, that makes uh, a lot of inno innovations uh, like NIC, uh, hot NIC add and remove, um, with a blue screen in your VMs, um, storage as well. So. Uh, nano server, uh, really, really really small footprint server for uh, server 2016. Um, I think the install image, the WIM image is like 140 max. Mm. So I, I think like if you do a base base install, it's like 55 max you need for, for a base install. So like Probably a core, is that like a core server install? Or is that a well, even less, right? So it, it only runs the binaries that you specify. Um, it's still got core OS, but nano is below that. Right. So there's nano, and then you build core OS on top of that, then you got Windows OS. Right. And we talk about uh, containers, uh, Docker support, and how do you manage it all with PowerShell Direct. So we're moving on to the next slide about shielded VMs. So the sh as you can see here, the, the shielded VMs uh, rely on uh, TPM as well, the TPM uh, chips. Um, it, I think it only uh, it also support like virtual virtual TPMs or virtual uh, uh, security cards. Um, shielded VMs will be uh, encrypted, so the data is encrypted either BitLocker if you, if you use the Microsoft flavor or any other means. Um, plus, you can convert a running VM to a shielded VM, which means if you have your VM running in whatever public cloud, you convert it to a well, probably not whatever public cloud, probably uh, Azure. Uh, you make it a, a shielded VM and then you can uh, secure that even more. <coughs> Make a couple of times. The Linux Secure Boot is supported for uh, Ubuntu 14.04 and SUSE Linux Server 12. Uh, I don't know Red Hat if Red Hat is thinking about Securing <laughs> because we have Red Hat in the room, right? Is this yeah, on Azure, right? So you well on their, on Server 2016. So Hyper V it, a VM in Hyper V, you can now uh, secure it with Secure Boot. So probably it's in the works, but so this is uh, the slide on Nano Server. Uh, some more, sorry. Wrong, wrong, wrong button. There we go. Uh, so headless. So as you can see, that's the footprint for, for a regular server with GUI. This is server core and this is nano server. So really, really, really trimmed down. Um, so like no ba binaries in there. Um, there is a list, Microsoft has a list of what's supported uh, on nano server. Uh, I think it's a great candidate for like web servers or um, yeah, most most likely web servers. What I what I read from from what's supported. Containers. 
So how do they differ from uh, virtual machines? So um, as you can see here, this is this is your uh, Aryan, your hypervisor, the guest OS, app A, app B. How I like to compare it, it's, it's like built-in application virtualization. I don't know if you all know app V. You yeah. needed to build uh, infrastructure to be able to use app V and virtualize application. Now it's pretty much built-in. Um, with that comes also Docker in integration, and Docker is uh, being developed as part of uh, open source under the open source project. So, um, yeah, you can run it on uh, Microsoft Azure or a service provider or any data center that supports Docker. So, so is yours running Docker as a you can run Docker in within Azure, yeah. Uh, how to manage all PowerShell Direct? Um, PowerShell Direct, like when you, you had to have uh, access to your VMs in Azure, you need to open some access lists, some ports. Um, now with PowerShell Direct, it, it uses uh, uh, a different secure way to pretty much um, it's like remote PowerShell, but it uses, uh, um, how do you call it? So it, in, it, it puts the, the command lines you put in locally, but it, it gets sent within a secure script block to the actual VM that it needs to run on. So I don't Got it. Go ahead, yeah, any questions? Oh, understood, yeah. Right. So what I like about uh, this one is pretty much an overview of um, all the technologies in 2016. So looking in the, at the cloud, Azure, on-premises, on our service provider, uh, you can use the container technologies on Windows Server or Linux, and then you have the container management, Docker, others, and PowerShell. Development environments with Visual Studio Eclipse and others. Uh, that's, most of this uh, information is actually taken from uh, this course. What's new? In, I think I broke it. No. Nope. What's new in Windows Server 2016? Uh, it goes in uh, much more detail than the new overview that, that I gave here. And then I have, I have one more Azure slide to show uh, um, the, t the 10 biggest Azure data centers, how big they are. Um, and Microsoft is bringing up, I think they have 18 running now, and they, they, they're going to 24 with, uh, I think, two new one here in Canada, and I think three in India, and one more, maybe down, down, down there, there in Australia. But <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have doubled the number of Google and AWS combined at this right. point. Yeah. And uh, in the last 45 days, we deployed a million CPUs, a million cores. A million cores? Not CPUs, awesome. cores. <laughs> So this is uh okay, parents, how many how many do they have like Yeah, I think I think it's eight. Yeah. So we got um US West, US like Northeast, so I think there's central the US to government and then there'll be two Canadian coming online. Right. Yeah. So the one in Washington is uh, using uh hydroelectric power, so it's all fully green. And uh besides of using this much fiber optic network. Um, I think Mark, Microsoft's network is in the top three of the world uh, networks worldwide. So that's how big it is. Where is Quincy? Uh, um, Northern Washington. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Washington State, right? It's, a, it's an internal data center, and it has every gen in there. We, yeah. do, we do testing with new gens there. Uh, yeah, that was that was me. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Terrence. Um, I'm also wondering whether the microphone battery is running out. I have to get Tesla to come in and look after my batteries <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, so just quickly, um, if anybody has any lightning talks, um, Jeff, I got an email from you. Yeah, yeah just reading it before. So if you wanted to take the floor and just talk about what's happening. 
Pot of the Woods. Thanks. Uh, Jeff King, I think I've met a lot of you before. I'm from Microsoft, I'm a technical evangelist. I also do the uh, Vancouver Azure Meetup. Um, so Matt and I have, I try and help out with this wherever I can as well, just to try and you know bridge some of the Azure stuff over. Um, but uh, we have a Windows 10 um, kind of development workshop day coming up in two weeks on the 26th. Um, if you're interested in, in coming to that, please let me know. Um, it's put on by BCIT and then we have a couple uh, Microsoft guys, myself presenting there as well as uh, Medhat from BCIT, if you know him. Um, so yeah, it's going to be good. We're going to cover like app development for Windows 10. Um, that's about it. Was there one other point? <laughs> I just briefly, it looked like you had two points. But maybe there were two pieces about the one point. Oh. You had two paragraphs. Yeah, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll do the other one another time. Okay. Um, the one other thing that's really cool about NanoCycle though that I'd just like to share with you is uh, they did research looking at patches for Windows Server um, prior to 2016. And they found that with Nano Server, uh, it'll only really need probably about one out of 10 patches on it because there's so much less code there, um, which is really great in terms of, you know, you're not gonna have to reboot your server, you're not gonna have to worry about Patch Tuesdays, things like that as often, right? So I think that's a, a big step forward as well. Anyways, thanks for uh, letting me get up. Yeah. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to share with the group? No. It's not an AA meeting, just uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, so, um, <laughs> I'm a cloudaholic. <laughs> Actually, that's a good idea. Can somebody remind me of that? And um, by the way, if so, Jeff here, you'll be able to find him on the list uh, for the meetup. But if you forget his name and everybody's name, just look for the organizer of this group and just shoot me an email and I'll pass you on to Jeff. Um, so, just talking about the next event, um, if you're lucky enough to have stored... Oh yeah, <laughs> Las Vegas is where the next event is. So, um, what we're planning on doing, uh, Amazon is having their reInvent, their big event uh, there in Las Vegas, and the first or second week, it's the 6th to the 9th, I think, of October. So, what we're planning on doing is, and I haven't talked to the other user groups uh, entirely yet, but planning on bringing together the Seattle, San Francisco, Dallas, Houston, and any other user groups that want to be a part of it, um, just gathering within that AWS space. Uh, I feel like it's a good place because everybody's probably dabbling in AWS or curious about it, because uh, they are the uh, gorilla in the public cloud space. So um, if you're lucky enough to have scored tickets, they did sell out pretty quickly, I think last month. Um, let me know, uh, I'll make sure that I keep you abreast of the information, but we'll be putting that up on the Meetup site. Um, so due to that, there won't be one in Vancouver next month, but just to let you know, the next local event will be the 4th of November at CodeCore, uh, so our usual venue, and um, details of that yet to be uh, announced. Um, but I was talking to Cisco today, and they're very interested in the feedback from our uh, uh, software-defined networking session that we did uh, I think it was last event or the event before. Um, so they're very uh, interested in giving us some demos and uh, uh, some details about the questions that we had around that. Uh, so moving on, oh yes, yeah, so I mentioned at the start of the night um, voting for topics. I think this is pretty important if you guys uh, have topics. I've listed a whole heap of topics there. If you've got any topics that you want to add to that list that you think others might be interested in, that I've forgotten about, let me know. Jump in there, vote. I've done it in such a way where you can put value to several topics, not just pick one topic that you like. So you can uh, vote on many different topics there. Really gives me a good breast of what you guys are interested in. Uh, this last bit here, I, I, I'm only here to give back to you guys. I, I, I get a lot from the interactions and hearing about what everybody else is doing, but also, uh, nobody's going to turn up if we're talking about something that nobody's interested in. 
Um, again, let me know if you've got something great that you're doing, if you've got a startup or something interesting that you've done or a use case for the cloud that you think is unique, or even if it's not unique, love to hear about what everybody's doing in the cloud. Uh, and uh, yeah, sponsors again, and this uh, video will be up uh, within the month on the Coffee Cloud site. And I think that's everything. Oh yeah, just quickly, uh, thank you to Robson's again. Uh, Chris, who uh, was running around frantically, panicking his boss earlier, telling him that there was 200 people attending in this small space. Um, so that's great. Uh, we can't have this without a space. And the Soft Choice team, who uh, they had a very busy day today for those uh, Soft Choice members that did come out. Uh, that was after a long, arduous lesson on cloud today, hence why they were more knowledgeable than me on what's going on in the cloud, uh, obviously by heckling me at the back there. <laughs> and yeah, thanks. Uh, here's contact details for uh, everybody that was speaking today. Paul's got a fancy little QR code, uh, which I thought I should probably include. <laughs> and uh, Terence there on LinkedIn and myself, the usual, so I'll put it in small print. Uh, so thank you, thank you for coming out, and uh, glad that I think we only went eight minutes over time for once. So uh, thanks again, thanks for speakers.